Hello. This TED Talk is being recorded in Stoke-on-Trent, part of North Staffordshire. And I'm a Staffordshire woman born and bred. I was born in Victoria, and in the 76 years of my life, I've never lived more than 12 miles away from Victoria. So it's not surprising that one of my heroes has always been another great Staffordshire man, Sam Johnson, Samuel Johnson, Dr. Johnson with the dictionary. But one thing he said has always miffed me a bit, both as a woman and as a Quaker. When told by a friend who had attended a Quaker meeting that he'd heard a woman preach, Sam said, it's not that it's done well, a woman preaching, it's rather that it's done at all. <laughs> Sometimes when I do this, when I stand up to talk about dementia, I feel a bit like that. I wonder if I'm the woman, or the woman preaching, the dog standing on the hind leg, the monkey on the top of the barrel organ, so that people can look at me and say, wow, look at her, she's got Alzheimer's disease, but she can still talk, she can still join sentences together. Isn't she amazing? Rather like people used to go to Bedlam to peer at the lunatics. Or is it that we who have dementia are the best people to talk about what it's like, to use our experience of what living with dementia and being a carer, as I have been on two occasions, using that experience to shape policy, to inform strategy, to make a difference to this dreadful illness that so many people will get. Society is beginning to accept that people with physical disabilities still have an awful lot to contribute. Look at the Invictus game in the Paralympics, the actors in the media, at academia, look at Stephen Hawking. It's not like that with dementia. For many people, the diagnosis is still seen as the end of useful life. But as the song says, it ain't necessarily so. In the UK at the moment, there are about 800,000 people living with dementia. And it's expected that by the end of this decade, that would have gone up to a million. There was recent hope that at last they found a drug that would make a real difference. That the minute they move from the test tube to, to working with mammals, it doesn't work. So we're going, we've gone back, we've had to go back to the only hope being the drugs which have existed for at least 10 years, which held the symptoms back a little bit, giving us a bit of remission. To get the best out of these drugs, people need early diagnosis. But there's a huge problem with early diagnosis. The first is that people are afraid of it. And the second is that some medical opinion still says that it's better not to have the diagnosis because there's nothing you can do. Now, I'm a Stokey woman. My roots are in Ireland. And one of my guilty pleasures is Mrs. Brown's voice. <laughs> Those of you who watch it will know that Mrs. Brown had elocution lessons. And the result of her elocution lessons was that she learned to say, that's nice, instead of something that ends with off. <laughs> well, when I hear people say it's better not to have a diagnosis because there's nothing that can be done, my response is, that's nice. <laughs> For a great number of people in our country, a picture of dementia is fueled by the press and the media. It's a picture of the end stages of dementia, of people sitting around the walls of care homes, sense gone, memory gone, communication gone just sitting away their lives. And as long as public per perception is that, people will continue to fear diagnosis, stay away from their doctors, and miss out on invaluable support, not least from the Alzheimer's Society. The old name for dementia, the way I was first told about it by a friend of my grandmother's, is senile decay. And somehow that awful word is burned into our psyche. It's changing, but not nearly fast enough. My husband and I 
No, there's a woman who gives talks at Christmas who says, my husband and I, but I can't remember who it is. We live in an independent living complex of some 60 apartments. We look after each other, so we haven't needed yet to uh, involve the care facilities that are there, um, except for a couple of emergencies. It's a wonderful place to live. There are 60 flats, there are people from the ages of 55 to 99, usually with some need for care, or uh, in the future, certainly having need for care. And yet the response of the people in the place where I live to other people with dementia is, I didn't come here to live with people like that. I don't want to have people wandering around the corridors and knocking on my door at night. I'd rather be shot than have that. When I challenge this, as I regularly do, they actually say to me, oh, you haven't got Alzheimer's, but I've had it for seven years. Yet these same people are the most caring and loving people you could meet. They make food for people who are coming back from chemotherapy. They sit with the bereaved. They visit people who are not coming downstairs to join in the shared activity. They could not be better neighbours unless you have dementia. And I think that the reason for this is, particularly for elderly, very elderly people, is that it's the greatest fear. The first time I wrote anything after my diagnosis, I entitled the article, Dementia, Our Worst Nightmare, because having cared for two people with dementia, it was certainly mine. And that sense of it being the worst diagnosis you could have is very prevalent. But people who don't have early diagnosis are not able to make the decisions that we make to give up our too large home, to move somewhere where there would be care in the future, to get rid of so much stuff, and that included 10,000 books. Would you believe I lost my water? <laughs> Excuse me. Medication gives me a dry mouth. I was able to make a lasting power of attorney, to set up an advanced wishes directive so that my family know exactly what sort of care I do and don't want when I'm no longer able to say it for myself. But more importantly, I've been able to talk to my husband, my children, and my grandchildren about all the things that really matter. I've been able to build up a bank of memories against the time when they'll need happy memories. My grandson, who's a passionate political enthusiast, is, all my is always my companion when I go to the Houses of Parliament to talk to politicians. And afterwards we go and eat pizza and talk and say rude things about the politicians from the party we don't support who might have been there. It's part of me and my nan, just as a very meaningful and emotional visit to Auschwitz was, and on a completely different level, a visit to the London Palladium where Sheila Hancock and it enabled us to go backstage and Tim could actually st stand on the stage of the Palladium. And it's the same with my other nine grandchildren. We are building up this bank of memories. The poet Anne Riddler, writing of her husband getting ready to leave for, work, for war, used these words. Now we must use as plants would our tubers stored in better season, our honey in heaven, I'm not going into battle, but I am facing an enemy. An enemy that will take me away from my friends and family as truly as war would, and take me away from them long before I'm dead. But I hope there'll be many more tubers formed in happier season for them to feed on when that time comes. It will come. I'm not and I never have been in denial. At the moment, I've retained many competencies. For example, though I'm 76, I still work as a counsellor and as a supervisor for other counsellors. And their feedback is that my work is as good as it's ever been. But I've almost completely lost any sense of numbers. When I'm ordering online groceries, we never quite know what size or how many we'll get when the order comes. <laughs> Getting rest in the morning
building is a sort of lottery. Because sometimes tights and trousers are something that I just can't work out how, how to put on. Yet, I frequently re rejoice. I can do you a fair paper on Kafka. Shakespeare in production are on the page is my greatest passion. And I don't know if I dare say this at Stoke, but I will. Manchester United. Whoa. <laughs> I haven't got long enough to talk about Manchester United. The diseased brain is truly a very complex thing. In the last six months, when staying away from home, I'm frequently totally mystified about what will be on the other side of the door of my bedroom when I go out of it. A few weekends ago, while teaching at a Quaker college, I went for a brief rest after lunch. And my feeling was, when I woke up, that if I went through the door, I would step into a kind of nothingness I wasn't afraid of it, but I just didn't want to do it. So I stayed in my room. I got the means of making tea and coffee and hot chocolate. I got my Kindle, I got a loo, I got the bath. I wasn't a bit afraid, but approaching that door was more than I could do. So I missed a plenary, I missed a workshop, I missed my dinner. And then my iPad pinged and it was a Facebook post from someone who was at the conference commenting on one of the workshops and suddenly, like the mechanism of a lock going into place, I knew where I was. And I went downstairs and I had some cheese and biscuits and some coffee instead of dinner. And my friends at the Quaker College started to talk about what they could do to stop it happening again. Having in my welcome pack in the future a picture of the place where I was and writing a note of where I was to put up my bedside. I could have uh, a buddy who would come, always know where I should be, and make sure that I was there. Many of those people that would have done the Dementia Friends program that the Alzheimer's Society runs, and it makes such a difference to those of us who have dementia to be with people who've done that course and who understand it. But I'm one of the lucky ones, I think. I sometimes think that I've got three family, families. I've got my own large and dearly loved family and I include a lot of my friends in that because they're as dear to me as any family, who together with my husband totally accept my dementia, support me in every way they can. My faith community, as I say, I'm a Quaker, love and support me and give me both national and local work to do because they still trust me to do it. And my third family is the Alzheimer's Society who have helped me with information about the future, about the present, given me a file full of tips to manage my dementia, given me work to do that I really can commit myself to, and work that I feel so passionately about. But they're not a distant corporate body. They're a group of friends who give me a big hug whenever I go to the headquarters, who send me cheeky emails every time Manchester United lose who travel across London from Tower Hamlets to Euston because I've left my bag there again and my ticket and my purse are still there. That's Alzheimer's. A few weeks ago, I was attending a committee of a group I belong to about disability equality. And there was someone there who was deaf and she demonstrated to us the signing for Main Street. And it's this. I'll do it again. In order for people with dementia to live in the mainstream, we need that support. But it's not like that for everyone. Thousands of people are living with dementia who've never found their way to any services. And therefore, that figure of 800,000 plus is probably wildly underestimated. In the place where we live, there are at least two people who clearly have the symptoms of dementia, but they're too afraid, completely in denial, cause their partners a great deal of worry and trouble because they're not willing to go and get help because they're so afraid of the stigma. It's 
seems very fitting to me that this talk is given at a sixth form college. Because the future, the way of getting rid of the stigma, is with young people. The Alzheimer's Society at the moment are in partnership with war people, the scout movements. You can now get a badge in dementia if you're a scout or a cub. And one young scout went home and told his family that he thought that the problems they were having with grandma were probably because she had dementia. The family hadn't noticed it, but he was right. At Manchester University, the law students have set up an advice clinic, a legal advice clinic, uh, supported by their professors, but free and open to anyone. And they now have a specialist dementia section. And there's a lot of legal advice needed around the issues of dementia because of things like powers of attorney, human rights, advanced directives. A group in a sixth form college uh, in Worcestershire have designed an app which gives a loop of popular favourite music so that people with dementia simply have to press a button to have the music they love on a constant loop. My ten grandchildren, wow, <laughs> accept my dementia as naturally as if I had a cold. We call it Fizzy Hands, a name produced by my granddaughter who at five couldn't quite manage Alzheimer's. Much nicer, like Fizzy Hands. Like most grandmothers, I'm more proud of my grandchildren than I could possibly say. But I think I was never more proud than when my 15-year-old grandson, and those of you, and some of you here I know, will remember the embarrassment and the awkwardness of saying things when you were 15. We were going out on the family party to the theatre, and one of my 15-year-old grandsons said to me, Nanny, have you got your nappy bag? Because incontinence is part of my dementia. I don't think I ever loved him so much than when he went through his embarrassment to make sure that I was safe and comfortable. We need to look at dementia from the time of diagnosis until it's at its end, and to ensure that needs are met all the way along the way. Two and a half years ago, I went to the Houses of Parliament to lobby MPs just before the election. The plan was that during a day-long lobby, we would talk individually to two or three hundred MPs and ask them to put a commitment to dementia care improvement in their election leaflet. The night before, we were in a London hotel and Paul and I had just gone to bed. When my daughter rang to say that my mother, who was 92, no, she was 94, had just died. She was in the last stages of vascular dementia. She was five stones. She was being beautifully cared for in hospital. Her little arms were black from the fingertips to the shoulders with inserted cannulas. She had liver failure, so she was itching and throwing herself around her bed because of the itching. And so the nurses had had to put mattresses to cocoon her so she didn't hurt herself. She couldn't swallow, that mechanism had gone. Yet every day, the nurses came to us very embarrassed, or the bed managers came to us and said, here's a list of care homes you need to move her to one because she's bed blocking. Do you know how long she was in hospital? 10 days. Can you imagine that happening to anyone dying with any other illness? It's not good enough. There's still so much work to be done. Much as I wanted to that night, I didn't go home. I stayed to do the lobby. My mum was really proud of me as a campaigner. She used to say, if you're in a fight, our Sheila's the best person to have on her side. And I felt that the best way I could honour her memory was to go to Parliament 
and to talk about dementia and what it's actually like to live with this as a person who has the illness or as the carers for whom it's, frankly, even more difficult. So I went to Port Pillar's house and I joined the lobby and I smiled at the members of parliament for a party I don't like to join. <laughs> and I'm going on campaigning. This TED talk is a way of campaigning. In the words of my very dear friend, Chris Rogers, whose story you might have seen on Panorama, Chris's story, I may have Alzheimer's, but it hasn't got me, not yet. Thank you.